Hey everybody, it's Josh Rutledge, your co-host for Fearscape Paranormal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to support us more, please head over to our website, fearscapepodcast.com. There you can click on store and browse some really awesome t-shirts and maybe pick a couple up, or even go to our Patreon page and see how you can support us monthly. We love bringing you awesome content just as much as you like listening to it. Enjoy the show. The following program is presented for entertainment purposes. WCHQ does not necessarily endorse the ideas presented. Fearscape is a program that explores the legends and lore around many creepy and scary things. Information is researched and presented in an entertainment fashion and is presented based off of what we found. Legends have a way of changing over time. So... Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another spooky edition of Fearscape. Fearscape. Here on 100.9 FM WCHQ, as well as the Destination Nation Network. I am one of your hosts, Stefan Gearhart, and I am joined, as usual, by the magnificent Josh Rutledge. Magnanimous? Matt, nope. I said <laughs> magn- ma- milk of magnesius. Yeah, Josh Rutledge. Rutledge. Uh, We've got a really cool episode today. We're going to be covering uh, the Exorcism of Roland Doe, which is what inspired the 1971 novel The Exorcist, as well as the 73 film adaptation. We also have in the studio back with us our good friend Keith Age, who's got some pretty good firsthand experience with some of this. Uh, He was part of a documentary that was made called The Haunted Boy uh, that was on sci-fi, and it's pretty awesome, and we're going to have him here to help fill in some blanks and talk to us about his experience of being at the actual house where a lot of this took place and uh but we're we're man i'm super pumped man yeah, you guys doing okay good, good episode hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit <laughs> <laughs> you do what you can man it's it's the holiday season <laughs> so why not talk about demon possession right? right exactly uh so but yeah we're gonna get into that but before we get into that let us get into a little bit of spooky news All right, so for spooky news, boy, oh boy, do I got a good one. Uh, This is called, uh, from a website called Singular14, and that's T-E-A-N, not T-E-E-N. But anyways, the headline reads, Trucker reports seven-foot-tall person with wings near O'Hare International Airport. Oh, yeah. Sure wasn't (laughs) just an airplane, you know. No way, man. (laughs) So, uh... The uh, Manuel Navarrete of UFO Clearinghouse, another place like MUFON, received a report recently from a man who said he was standing outside of a cargo dock at O'Hare International Airport in Chicago when he spotted a seven-foot-tall person with wings just outside of a fence by the parking lot. The sighting reportedly took place real recently at uh, around 6.30 p.m. on November 26th. So this is just a few weeks back. Just right Uh, before Thanksgiving? Yeah. So according to the... Maybe it was a turkey. Uh, (laughs) Uh, So, (laughs) according to the report, the man said, I was at the airport picking up a load at uh, Nippon Cargo Airlines, and I was already backed into a dock and was standing away from the truck smoking a cigarette while they loaded my truck. I was looking toward the runways in the direction of the tunnel, and that is when I noticed something that looked like a large bird standing just outside the fence of the parking lot. It was not hard to miss because two street lamps were nearby. It looked like a person, but with wings that were stretched out and flapping, and it had just big red eyes and it was walking away from the fence towards the open field and then it began to flap its wings and disappear uh navarette was able to speak with the witness over the phone he says i spoke with the witness and was able to get a little more information the witness primarily spoke in spanish but was able to report the sighting uh with the help of his daughter and her boyfriend He was standing away from his truck as it was being loaded, smoking the cigarette, like we said. Uh, The witness stated that the creature was about seven feet tall, using the fence as a point of reference. When I asked him how he was able to be so certain as the height of the being, the driver stated that he was 
he had been to this location many times and he estimates the fence to be about eight feet high. Using the fence, he was able to ascertain that the being was at least seven feet tall. When I asked him how large the wings were, he said at least six feet across and black. Mm. Uh, so uh, this here, it continues to go on that um, they believe that this is possibly a Mothman sighting. Well, so, something that's really interesting here is, and we, we when we had John Keith and you talked about the, uh, the stuff out in the desert with the uh, Native American stuff, right. you know, a lot of these things have red eyes. Yeah. Your night hags always have red eyes. Yeah. I mean, is that looks like a common trait for things that go bump in the night is they have red eyes. Well, so do a certain type of owl that me and my girlfriend were discussing yeah. the other night. This thing, these things are six, almost six feet tall. They have big bulbs, red oh, eyes. Oh, yeah, I saw that on Facebook, those really big birds that are almost as big I as mean, these, these are owls, and, you know, birds of the feather do flock <laughs> to airports and things yeah. of that nature. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, who knows? Yeah. Well, well and, and, and maybe they are flocking because within the same area, within a 15-mile radius, since dating back into October, there were sightings of a large-winged humanoid in Park Ridge. There was a large-winged humanoid accompanied by several other beings on October 19th. Uh, near the Edward Hotel in Rosemont, uh, there was a sighting of a tall creature with bright red eyes and large wings uh, near O'Hare in July recently, uh, as well as a six-foot tall creature flying over the Des Plaines River in Rosemont, Illinois. So once again, the Mothman has been sparking up some debate again, showing up. So, yeah, so it's interesting would would be to look at uh, if um, there is one of those you know type of owls. Uh, that has also been spotted in the area because mm -hmm. you would think that if you're a bird watcher, I'm sure there's ornithologist. A... Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you're lucky I had that yeah, one. Really. <laughs> <laughs> that they probably have noticed if something's in the area, right? So. Well, you know, I know a lot of cryptozoologists, and the very first thing they'll tell you is 95% of everything that has been, you know, documented is misidentified, you know, and there's, it's probably only about 5% that they can't figure out what it is. Right. But it's that 5% that's right. got me excited. Oh, right? yeah. <laughs> so it's the same here. It's like your website, you know, it says that you live in the 1% space, right? Yep. So, yep. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, well, yeah. that's what I had for spooky news. So uh, we'll go ahead and get out here. I don't think either of us said we had any creepy catch up. No right? creepy catch up. Nothing. Yeah, it was a pretty nice week. I've actually had a pretty good week. I think I've probably been too busy uh, yes. to notice anything. Yes, so, same, yeah. same. Uh, so, yeah, so let's move right into the topic for the eve. Uh, so what do we got, Josh? The exorcism of Roman Doe. Or Robbie Monheim, or whatever. I yeah. mean, this guy, this thing yeah. has had many pseudonyms. Right. No, <laughs> his, his real also, name is Roland. It is Roland because yes. I've also heard Ronald Doe. Well, and... then that's his nickname. Okay. Okay. Well, and also in my, in my research, I came across Robbie or Rob. Well, that's, that's, that's yeah, that's the one I saw here. The Robbie Monday plume that has okay. been added. Well, I wondered how. I much... also saw Jack. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wondered how much of that was to protect his. Identity, you know, a lot of it because he grew up to be a rocket scientist yes. for NASA. Yes. <laughs> well, so and, and that's what I didn't. I didn't when I was doing research on the the exorcism piece. I didn't actually pull a lot of the detail in around what happened to him after the fact. So yeah, according to him, he doesn't remember anything. Yeah, yeah, know? that's what I've heard too. That's interesting. So yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> I um, hopefully. Uh, uh, Keith, you won't look at me and say, where the crap did you do your research at? Because hopefully I got some good information here that you, no, can, um, you can help me. Uh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, so you went to Ghostopedia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Wookiepedia. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, we've got. Uh, um, so, uh, Roland was born into a uh, German Lutheran family in the uh, night. And uh, basically in the 1940s, 1949 is when uh, kind of all this stuff uh, started taking place. Um, so the family lived in uh, Cottage City, Maryland. Right. And uh, Roland was an only child, and he depended upon, you know, the adults in his life for uh, for playmates. So he'd have been about 14, because it looks like he was born around 1935, yep. right? So 14, right. 15 14, years old. 14, 15 years mm -hmm. old. Uh, and primarily his uh, his Aunt Harriet. Um, and uh, his, his aunt was, a, it says here, was a spiritualist and introduced Roland to the Ouija board 
uh, when he expressed interest in it. Now, one thing, I, like I saw, there was a lot of in, in your in your documentary, you know, The Haunted Boy, there's a lot of mention of the Ouija board, and something that always just, <laughs> I don't know, got me a little bit is, anytime they talk about a Ouija board, it seems to always be in a very negative, you know, demon calling type of thing. Like, yeah. that's the only thing you use a Ouija board for is to get touched. Just call Satan. Hey, Satan, I need a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so goodbye. I, so, I mean, it, you know, it's just... Um, and maybe that's just a little bit of storytelling. I don't know. I think it is. I, I think a lot of it is you put in what you get out of it. And because I don't think the devil is at Parker Brothers. Exactly. Uh, going standing at the end of the assembly line going, this one's haunted. This one's haunted. Right. This one's not. This mm-hmm. one is. This one is. You know, I think a lot of the older stuff, the stuff that uh, the Druids came out with, because uh, that's where yeah. the Ouija board actually comes from. Oh, yeah. From. I've seen some real leather talking boards oh, yeah. and, made uh, from skin and so, yeah. some weird stuff. Animal skin, I assume? Yes, okay. not human skin, no. <laughs> no I've seen Though them. I'm I've, sure there's human ones I've for sure. I've seen them with human yeah, skin. I've yeah, I've seen tattoos. As uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, so again, I think it's a lot of it is whatever faith you put into it is what you're going to get out right. of it. Uh, if you're a bunch of kids wanting to be scared, you're right. going to get scared. Right. Yeah, I've also heard tale that Parker Brothers themselves put a lot of the negative press out for Ouija boards as a way to help push sales. Oh, yeah. It's a scary thing. I well, mean, you know. <laughs> one of the, but I've never had any bad experiences well, with it. So. One of the images that you that shows in The Haunted Boy of, of like the, the original Parker Brothers boxing, mm-hmm. <laughs> the um, it's like they're asking... What will I be when I grow up? I mean, it's just like <laughs> rocket scientist. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, see, now you can go back to when you're dealing with toys. Again, whatever you put into it is probably what you're going to get out of it. Magic 8-Ball. Yeah. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. Robert the Doll. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Robert. Teddy Ruxpin. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you, you're going to put a cassette tape into yeah. that, so you're going to get a recorded <laughs> voice. Yeah. That's what you're going to get out of it. <laughs> Uh, what else we got, Josh? Yeah, so um, so anyway, so you know, he had special interest in a Ouija board, and his aunt Harriet uh, introduced Which, him to it. Uh, man, Aunt Harriet—that's a classic aunt name, by the way. By the way, is it aunt or aunt? I don't know. Uh, depends. You know, like I have a uh, an aunt Joan, but my aunt Paulette. <laughs> I swear, <laughs> I call my aunt Joan Aunt Joan. Same side of family. Same side. Oh my goodness! Yeah. <laughs> don't ask me why. I don't know. Well, my uh, my sister in law. A little off topic. My sister in law. Um, just really wants us to refer to her as auntie. Mm-hmm. So. That's Sarah likes. My wife likes aunt. Yeah. So. All right. So uh, the. Um, so, yeah, 13, 14, Roland um, living in uh, Cottage City, Maryland. In the early January, uh, shortly after his aunt Harriet died, uh, Roland began to experience tr- strange things. Uh, he heard scratching sounds coming from under the floors, in the walls in his room. Uh, water dripped inexplicably from pipes and walls. That would make me offer my soul to the devil. Now, you got to remember, this is the late 40s. Yeah. Right. In a house in Maryland, who who knows how the age I just of think house. of that Donald yeah. Duck cartoon where the faucet keeps dripping, and he just gets so <laughs> frustrated. <laughs> By the way, my, my kids uh, refer to me as Donald Duck because I've get mad and have irate screaming fits when I <laughs> <laughs> yep fantastic uh, I have twins who uh, Donald Duck's kind of like main main um, people that are things that make him mad Chip and Dale I have twin girls they're my Chip and Dale so <laughs> <laughs> so they're not Chip and Dale's dancers no <clears throat> wrong anyways yep. so in uh Shortly after her death, started experiencing strange things. The most troubling thing was that his mattress would suddenly move. So, I mean, bed, I don't know, mattress would suddenly move. Um, so, disturbed, Ronald's family sought the help of every expert they knew. The uh, Hunklers, I guess is the last name there, uh, consulted doctors, psychiatrists, and even their local Lutheran minister. Um, but no help to be had now what i wonder is is did the parents experience any of this were they able to see any of this they did see it and uh, that is why they finally got some advice that you need to get out of maryland and go to st louis that's what i figured because you know we talk about this a lot on my horror movie podcast because in in movies parents never believe the kids 
and the uh, husband never believes the wife. Like it's always <laughs> one of we were talking about this last yeah. last episode. It's like you know you just you just have a crazy imagination. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's just like you know, and so I'm like I I assumed they had to have seen something for them to say okay. You know? Well, so the, it, it kind of talks a little, a little bit about it here. And um, basically, it says that at one point in time, you know, I'll get to it in just a second, but they he had some writing on his uh, stomach that or chest that identified that maybe they needed to score it at St. Louis. Right. It, it actually says St. Louis mm-hmm. on his yeah. Uh, stomach. Yeah. So that was what the indication was to go to St. Louis. Writ- written backwards on his stomach. Mm. So almost as if it was coming from, from the, the inside. inside. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's cr- ooh, that gave me jerkin spells. <laughs> jerkin spells. That's what my dad uses. <laughs> 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 That's what he says to this day for heebie-jeebies. He says, "Ah, you give me jerkin spells." Well, you know, as a Wiccan who casts spells, it, it may be interpreted as something else. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it may. <laughs> I do have spells for that. Okay, so. Their uh, local Lutheran minister, uh, they suggested that the family seek the assistance of the uh, Jesuits. Now, I gotta ask, what what is Jes? I mean, I'm always Jesuits are a sect of of Catholicism. There's a lot of different subsects sects, and a lot of times the Jew- Jesuits are close. I would say to modern monks. Okay, are they? Are they, they were like, a pretty big sect. Are though. they like more intense, li- less intense? Are they more, I guess, focused on the Catholicism? Yeah, because yes. uh, yeah, they. Okay. They the, the the reason I bring up monks is because monks devote right. themselves. I mean Jesuits, and, are and that's much- basically what they ended up doing when they got to St. Louis. You know, there was uh, fourteen priests that got to interact with yep. this boy, and uh, they ended up putting him into one of the. Uh, it's not even there anymore. I, I just lost the name of it. it started with an A. Uh, it's a. It was almost like a cathedral and a total place where, uh, like a hospital just for mm-hmm. this stuff. Oh, I'm trying to think yeah. of it. Um, Not an asylum. No. Um, no. Yeah, I know what you mean. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the only thing left of it is the parking lot and uh, the the huge cross that's set out in front of it is actually in the St. Louis Museum. Yeah, I saw that yeah. in the uh, documentary. Yeah. I already well. plan on going to check that out next time I go to St. Louis. So and, it, and and they just said. There's not a lot we can do with him, and then that's when he got sent to the other place, yeah. And that's where almost everything that was documented was took place. Yeah, and but, I would add that Jesuits are kind of close to nuns in a way, where okay. they really their whole that's devoted to works, okay. right? You know, and so they're not really at churches a lot of times and things like that. They're working. Gotcha. You know, they're okay. doing stuff. They're out in the community, so to speak. Yes. <clears throat> so. So they get to, um, they go to Father E. Albert Hughes, who is a local uh, Catholic priest, and asks his superior's permission to perform an exorcism on the boy in late February 1949. Oh, so they moved pretty quick. Well, <clears throat> I don't think, they're not in, they're not in uh, St. Louis yet. Right, but no, I mean, like, even then. They're yeah. still in Maryland. Yes. Even then, yeah. I mean, this started in January. Right, so this is like a month later. Yeah, maybe I, mean, weeks. That, I mean, we, how many stories do we come across, well, like, how long the, it takes? The bloody St. Louis is what threw him over the edge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so this, so this cat uh, tries, a, tries an exorcism, and um, Ronald broke off a piece of the spring from the mattress he was strapped down to. And lashed the priest across his shoulders. Woo. So I mean, from a for you know to be 13, 13 14 years old, mm-hmm. yeah, strapped to a bed. He had, he had just turned and, thirteen. So I mean, that's that's a lot of strength to unlash yourself. I still can't do that. Rip a spring <laughs> out of the mattress, yeah. and then attack someone. I mean, that's it's pretty um, impressive. Yeah, I'd say. you know, it's the strength of Zeus there. Yeah. Um, so. A few days later, <clears throat> some red scratches appeared on the boy. One of the scratches formed the word Lewis, which indicated that Ronald's mother needed to go to St. Louis. Uh, where they, you know, they had relatives there as well. So in order to find a way to, to save their son. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> a cousin of the family was attending St. Louis University at the time of Roland's struggles. Um, she put the Hunklers in touch with Fa- Father Walton H. Halloran, and Reverend William Bowdern. Is that the correct pronunciation? Sounds like it. So. Bowdern, yes. Uh, 
So after consulting with the university's president, these two Jesuits agreed to perform an exorcism on young Roland uh, with the help of several assistants. And this is this where you talk right. about the 14 individuals involved. Right. <coughs> so I need a young priest and an old priest and another <laughs> priest and a brother named Daryl and another priest and another priest. And I another need priest. a red priest, blue, <laughs> blue priest. priest. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> so, yeah, so the men gathered uh, <coughs> at the residence on Roanoke Drive on, in March 1949. So, again, Roanoke Drive. <coughs> How ironic. So, and again, <coughs> 1949, this all started in January, January 1949. Two months. We're two so months, we're two months in. <clears throat> there the exorcist uh, witnessed scratching on the boy's body and the mattress moving violently. Um, these were the same types of things that had happened in Maryland when the first exorcism failed. Hmm. Amid these bizarre happenings, Bowdern and Halloran, according to their reports, noticed a pattern on, uh, in Roland's behavior. He was calm and normal during the day, but at night, uh, after settling in for bed, he would exhibit strange behavior, including screaming and wild outbursts. So this is, it, it, you know, it kind of says here in Perrin's that these are the details that identify as a true story in The Exorcist. The, right. The actual, this uh, is the the yeah. bed moving, the screaming. Right. The he, he would also start speaking in Latin, but it would only happen at nighttime. And only at nighttime. Very interesting. Makes you makes you think back to other legends and lore about creatures that can only exist at night. Well, I mean, that that was at the beginning of this. Now, now this at this point when they did the exorcism and everything that Josh is talking about, they were already in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is they're in St. Louis. They got in touch with the folks. They 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 assembled their exorcist party. Um, and uh, they went over to the house. <laughs> Time for an exorcist party, y'all. <laughs> and uh, and they got to work. So, yeah. Um, it says that Ronald would also enter a trance-like state and start making sounds in a guttural voice. So that also fits the, the book and the movie as well. Yep. So the, uh, the priest supposedly also saw mysterious uh, flying objects in the boy's presence. And noted that he would react violently when he saw any sacred object presented by the attending Jesuits. Interesting. So, uh, so just objects in the room flying around. Yep. Okay. I mean, whatever is prevalent in 1949. So not the Mothman. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, I don't think they saw other cryptids <laughs> front <around> and side. <laughs> It's a party, yo. <laughs> Welcome to the Exorcist party. This is Bigfoot. Uh, don't float too high. The ceiling's only eight foot. Ain't no party like it. It's just a party. <laughs> yeah. So, um, at uh, so so at one point during this weeks long ordeal, so Matt, it's a weeks long. I mean, right. this is like they're over there like every day or every other day trying to get something to happen. So I mean, that's that's perseverance, right? Yeah. There. I mean, it's to, not only for the family. But also the people who are involved in trying well, to... Well, and, you know, everything we've read about exorcisms and stuff like that, it is a, a misnomer that it can be done in five minutes. I mean, it a lot of times does take you mean, weeks, You mean months. John Constantine didn't just walk in? No, neither did Sam Put a mirror over and, top of the neither bed. Neither did Sam and Dean from Supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, Borden reportedly saw an X appear in the scratches on Ronald's chest, which he believed um, signified the number 10. I don't understand the importance of the number 10. Um, Maybe just the multitude, you know, number the, of things. the whole legion yeah. aspect. Maybe. Plus um, another thing, it, when you get talking about the X, uh, when you're dealing with Catholicism, a lot of people think a cross is how they actually hung people. They didn't hang them by a cross. They actually did it what, what looks like a T, but set down sideways. Right. To where it's almost an X. Right. And that's where a lot of that also comes from, too. Yeah, I have, I have actually seen that in, like, uh, uh, historical depictions of things where they would have, basically, your spread out arms and legs right. spread eagle on this thing, mm-hmm. as opposed to the, the typical cross with your feet crossed in the middle right. and, and nailed down. So, yeah, <clears throat> not that you wouldn't also be nailed down on this game because you have to be held up there somehow. But, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> it says in another incident... A pitchfork-shaped pattern uh, of red lines moved from the boy's thigh and snaked down towards his ankle. So this is like lines drawn, and it moved. Um, that, that's uh, that's that's 
That's a whole different ball game right there. I mean, yeah, and, I, and I've seen that. I've seen that imagery show up in other demon oh, yeah, type a lot movies. Of, well, and and like in Hauntings, uh, yeah. a lot of people get scratched. Yes, I, I got it's, scratched. <laughs> it's it's in a, usually in a three mm-hmm. form, like it's like three three fingers just straight yeah, down. That's what I had at the Whispers Estate. I had three go across here and three go across the other side of my neck. So I'm gonna say real quick because yeah, I was thinking about this. I was listening to one of the older podcast and you were talking about one of your night hags mm-hmm. and um your night hags always have three fingers mm-hmm. and a lot of these uh, talking about like the cryptids and things a lot of those things have three fingers aliens have three fingers there's, there's like a lot of mickey mouse has three fingers <laughs> well it actually has four. four well if you count three and a sum but yeah. anyway so but i mean there's just a lot of that type of similarity between uh, stories and accounts of the three finger piece yeah Absolutely. Uh, three fingers of chicken. Um, and I will tell you this. I looked up what the number 10 means in the Bible. Uh, in, the, in the Bible, the number 10 is known as a symbol of the authority of God and his government on the earth. So I find that very interesting. <laughs> huh. That is interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's almost, well, I mean, I guess in this case. It could case, be a mock It could be well. mocking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a, so these types of things happened uh, every night for more than a month. And everyone witnessing the events believe that Roland was possessed by ten demons. Simply based off of that, that 10. ten? That X being there. Okay. So, <clears throat> again, it, it could have been a misinterpretation uh, of whatever that X was intended to sure. represent. All but, right. I mean, you know, that's what they went with at the time. Yeah, so. I mean, it could, I mean, we could, we could theorize all day on what that means. Yeah, it's only an hour show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the uh, so the, the the two main priests, which was the uh, Bowden and I don't remember the other guy's name, Halloran, I think. Yeah, Halloran. Yep. <coughs> um, they uh, they never gave up. Uh, they continued the exorcism night after night. On the evening of March twentieth, the exorcism reached an unhealthy new level. Ronald urinated all over his bed and began shouting and cursing at the priests. Now, Ronald's uh, parents or I guess Roland in this case, had <coughs> had enough. They took him to Alexian Brothers Hospital. This Alex- was, yeah, that's what it was, Alexian. Yep. In, in St. Louis for more serious treatment. So now. they basically have said, okay, the church isn't working. Right. Let's go to science. Well, no, they haven't taken him to the church yet. He went from his house to Alexian Brothers. Well, I just meant the church in general. Well, that's the Alexian Brothers, that's more like the monk oh, situation. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah so it's a, it's a Catholic it hospital. Is a, yeah. Right. Kind of like uh, St. Mary's and Elizabeth. Yeah, or right. Our Lady of Peace. <clears throat> and they kept him there for a little over, I think it's a week and a half to two weeks, and then they moved him again. Yeah, so they, uh, yeah, so the, and I remember in the documentary, it, it talks about um, the, they went to the new building right. for the Alexa Brothers, and nobody there wanted to talk about or even acknowledge Mm-hmm. That, that anything actually happened. Yeah, like I said, the old the old building is gone. All right. that's left of that is the, the cross in the museum. And <clears throat> one of the things that happened while he was there, the parking lot cracked. Yes, yes, I saw okay. that on there. All right. And they heard it from inside. Yeah. It was just, they thought there was actually like an earthquake or a, you know, the plate shifting or something. That's yeah. how bad it cracked. Wow. And they have repaired it and repaired it since 1949. Even they poured asphalt over it and everything else, it still cracks to this day. Hmm. Is it still there? Yeah, or it was when. Yeah, we, they when said we I saw that that they said that they kept they tried to repair it. They tried to do mm-hmm. everything. Right. They've tore it all the way down to the yeah, dirt to no avail and, and, to put it know, back. That, that's crazy. It's the same crack every time. So the. Um, Finally, on April 18th, um, a miracle, uh, as here in quotes, occurred in Ronald's room at, at Alexian Brothers. It was the Monday after Easter, and Ronald awoke with seizures. He yelled at the priest, saying that Satan would always be with him. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> the priest laid holy relics, cru- crucifixes, medals, and rosaries on the boy. At 10.45 p.m. that evening... The attending priest called on St. Michael to expel Satan from Ronald's body. They shouted at Satan, saying that St. Michael would battle him for Ronald's soul. Seven minutes later, Ronald came out of his trance and simply said, 
he's gone. The boy recounted how he had had a vision that St. Michael vanquished Satan on a great battlefield. God, I would love to know the details of his vision. Like, I would love to ask him yeah. to describe that. Well, but, I mean, he doesn't remember any of it. So. Well, I mean, like, at the time. Oh, at the like, time. I would have yeah. loved to, if someone yeah. had recorded that. Hey, and hey, that you went through this ordeal for two and a half months. Can we? Can you just go ahead and read this off to a stenographer? So <laughs> no, it? that's not what I mean. I, <laughs> I would <laughs> just love to ask him questions yeah. about well, it. Well, see, that's, that's why we have the 14-page document yeah, the, from the, the priest. The, the priest diary, yeah. You know, and, uh, I mean, they sat down every night and typed this thing out. And um, a lot of it, you could say, okay, somebody's faking. But then there's other stuff that you can't fake. The you know, he had nothing sharp in his room to create the words, and he ended up with writing all over him uh, and stuff. And it also got up here, and he wrote on the bed every night in Latin. Yeah, they gave him a pen or a marker. Or well, whatever. they ended up putting. Instead of sheets on his bed, they ended up putting paper yeah, on his bed. And right. they, they gave him a marker and a pencil, and it would just, by morning, it'd be full. And those things are locked up in the Vatican. Yeah. Uh, man, I would pay every bit of money I have to visit those Vatican vaults. Yeah. Well, Not just we, for this we purpose. tried. Yeah. <laughs> they, we, we got a resounding no. I, I mean, one of the coolest dreams I ever had is that I broke into the Vatican vault. <laughs> and seriously, and I, I had found there were cryptids down there and creatures and cages. And Jimmy Hoffa. And, and Jimmy Hoffa's down there, yeah. <laughs> and just so much cool stuff. Well, if you believe the uh, the theory that uh, of the multiverse, that when you dream at night, you dream of yourself in a different mm-hmm. multiverse experience doing the, maybe you did maybe i did maybe i did but i do want to talk about the diary real quick now according to the documentary this was only found not too long ago right yeah and it was in the last five years right yeah. at, and this was at uh where was that found in the other location Is yeah that... and in the the new place where they had the the new uh, uh lisa's brothers is actually a section eight housing now yeah that's what i was gonna say All and right. that the whole fifth floor you can't they were told it's, not to touch it's it. The, it's the it's it's the roof. Yeah, it's the ceiling. Uh, you know, there's nothing but rafters up there and one room. Yeah, and yeah. that was his room. That's where they put him. You come up the elevator and you turn right, and that's it. This, this place is still under lock and key. Yeah, it was cool seeing you guys go up yeah. there, and you know the fact that it's still untouched, like that they were told yeah. leave it alone. Yeah, leave it yeah, alone. Yeah, they had everything moved down, and that is locked up at an army base. His bed. His chest of drawers. Yeah, just like Indiana um, Jones. Yeah. Ser- no, seriously, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. My um, second place I would like to break into. <laughs> yeah. We we tried to get access to that, and we were told leave or we'd be arrested by armed guards. Isn't that crazy, man? It's like, and well, uh, it's like where do they where do they really protect it? I mean, I mean it's just <clears throat> why and yeah. why? I mean, you know, this is the 1940s. You know, it's just. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And also, the movers that they, they paid to move mm-hmm. this stuff, within 24 hours, something bad happened to every one of them. Right. You and I talked about that, the mm-hmm. curse. The curse. Yep. That yeah. Even your crew had some stuff yeah, happen. Yeah, we had some stuff. Uh, and then, like I said, uh, that was a really creepy place and if you see the documentary and as we're driving by it looks like a castle mm-hmm. i mean it really does yeah. the pointy roofs and everything else and uh, and like i said it's it's now a section 8 housing where some of these people just do not have an, any idea what where they're living yeah, at i have no idea but they all mm. say that they've had stuff happen and right. even the the woman that was in charge was hesitant <laughs> oh yeah none of them want to talk uh and when we got to the house where they were staying at, you know, uh, I tell you what, I, I'm not a psychic at mm-hmm. all. I don't feel things when I go ghost hunting or whatever. There's only three places where the hair on the back of my neck has stood up, and this is one of them. Where we walk through the doorway, right through the house. <laughs> well, this is considered, you know, the Holy Grail. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for right. sure. <clears throat> well, it, you know, so I found that what's interesting is there was like several newspaper articles, and I guess that's really where 
more mainstream individuals heard or found out right. about the exorcism and all the events. And that's probably what spawned Well, that, that's where Peter Blatty right. heard about it. And he heard about it in college. Uh, and, uh, again, Hollywood, got, after he wrote the book, Hollywood got a hold of oh, it. Oh, yeah. And changed it from, Mar- uh, from St. Louis to Maryland because Maryland's more of a, it was a you know more of the capital and everything else, yeah. and this is happening in our. Well, it also uh, has a very uh, Maryland has a very kind of steeped, uh, oh, yeah. you know, ancient kind of feel to it. As yeah. far as when you talk about the United States in in the uh, how the age of of the country, anything that's on the East Coast just has more historical no, north, feel to it. Northern East Coast, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, you got Roanoke for God's sake, yeah, you know? right. You know. So I mean, it just. So I mean, from a from a uh, from a scare the crap out of people storytelling yeah. perspective, it would make sense to put it there. <laughs> but yeah, but that, but that's where Peter Blatty got. He heard the story, and then ex- did a little research and expounded yeah. on it. And the only thing he could find were those articles. Well, what's interesting here is what I found is they think that the uh, articles were um, the reason they they, had, they knew about the story was that the family's original Lutheran minister is who kind of I guess proper term is leaked. Right. The information to the papers. Mm-hmm. So that's like, that's kind of a, I don't know, that, that's kind of a... Hey, I mean, at least it wasn't them. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true, but I mean, it just, when you think about the trust that you put in your family minister to be able to, for them to go and say, hey, let me tell you about this crazy thing that had happened, you right. know, it's just, yeah, so it's kind I of... I mean, people talk. I mean, it doesn't even mean he leaked. He could have just been talking. Well, that's true. And, you know, somebody picked it up and said, man, that would make a great story. I mean, yeah. But we are talking about the diary. The thing that piqued my interest in the diary was there was one section where a janitor had came to work for the first time and as he's mopping the floor and everything the monks are introducing him to this patient that patient and he gets to Roland and they say this is uh, Roland he has epilepsy don't don't pay him no attention so they didn't even the kid is strapped down to the bed Okay, because at, at this point things are happening all through the day and night. All right. Yeah. And as they went on writing, he said that this janitor came and got one of them. Hey, there's something wrong with this kid. And they would don't worry about. It. He'll be okay. He's probably just having a fit. And he says, No, he's floating. <laughs> and at this point, the janitor just quit, and I'm not coming back. Wow. You know, so that that really got my interest in it, and. Uh, just the fact that, you know, they wrote this diary and it's been hidden for so long. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, like I said, the, the actual Vatican wants nothing to do with us. Or, you know, we right. even offered to come over and, you know, how much of a donation could we make? Right. And just to see it. it it's really because so on the one hand, you could say, well, they're they're hiding something. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, you could say, well, maybe they just don't want the, the negative press that comes along with the validation of events occurring. Right. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there was just so much stuff that happened, like the bed spring across the, the shoulder. You've got uh, even uh, one of the priests got his nose broke. I think Halloran got his nose yeah. broke by the kid. I mean, here's this kid. He's right. just a little well, kid. Well, you got to remember something. Bowden was an ex-army ranger, like a mm-hmm. priest. He was not some young shy thing. He was also an ex football player. Right. Uh, he was a big bulky guy, and he couldn't control this thirteen year old boy. Right. He couldn't out muscling. Well, I remember in the in the documentary that I think it was about, and they were talking about uh, went to the Catholic went to the Catholic Church, wanted to enlist for World War Two. They said no. Mm-hmm. Uh, he went to somebody else. I guess a higher uh, party in the Catholic right. Church. They said no, and he basically said, I'm just going to not give up. You're just going to have to let me in. And so the family, they, they let yeah, him in. Yeah, you know, becoming a chaplain. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But it was like a chaplain with one of the toughest squads. Yeah. In yeah I guess it was the ninth unit of the Army Rangers. Shoo wee, and, and that's how he actually got in. He They were still telling him, no, no, no. He went and signed in. Yeah. And, you know, you know enlisted. And then once he was in there, that's when the Army said, Oh, you're a priest. We need priests. Yeah, yeah. And but he saw his share of combat and everything else. Yep. So, <clears throat> one thing that um, I, I do like to do whenever we have topics like this 
is I like to pull in some, I guess, uh, counter arguments or, or, or people who dispute mm-hmm. the validity of what's being. Well, that's fine. Told. It's like you know, I, I gave you one for the owl earlier. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> which is complete bull crap. But I mean, it's fine. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Fine, those owls are six foot tall, but this was a seven foot tall. Yeah, this one's seven. That owl was standing on a on a stool or something. I don't know. <clears throat> so um, we got this author guy named Thomas B. Allen. Okay. Are you familiar with him at all? No. Okay. So um, he basically says that um, the <clears throat> Jesuit priest, Father H. Halloran, was one of the last surviving eyewitnesses of the events. And Alan wrote in it uh, that a diary kept by the attending priest, uh, Raymond Bishop, detailed the exorcism performed um, on the pseudonymously. Pseudonymously. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Roland Doe, a.k.a. Robbie. So right, this yeah, this all comes from his book, Possessed, the True Story of an Exor- exorcism, exorcism in 93. So uh, Alan was speaking at an event in 2013, and he said, emphasized that definitive proof that the boy known only as Robbie was possessed by malevolent spirits is unattainable. Maybe he instead suffered from mental illness or sexual abuse or fabricated the entire experience. According to Alan, Halloran also, and this is in quotes, expressed his skepticism about potential paranormal events before his death. When asked in an interview, to make a statement on whether the boy had been possessed, Halloran responded saying, No, I can't go on record. I never made an absolute statement about the things because I don't feel it was qualified. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> I mean, I think this is probably just, a, this is a little bit of, you know, how can you state for a fact what can't be proven? Right. And so, I mean, so a little bit of that is, you know, not willing to go on record, uh, potentially, you know, not wanting to tarnish of uh, your entire lifetime as a priest and everything else. Um, and then also just a little bit of the, you know, like I said, how do you prove the unprovable? Well, well, again, I agree with you on certain aspects of this case could have just been, uh, I'm trying to get attention. Uh, I've just scared a hell out of everybody I know. Right. And, everything else but there's certain things that like i said what got me was the guy's floating over here you know right and yes. he's tied down to the bed uh, we can do that now with special effects couldn't do it back in right yeah and uh, you know when there's nothing in the room to create the cuts and the lettering and right. everything else in your room how does that happen it looks like it starts up as a welt you know, yeah. from the inside coming up, bubbling up, bubbling up. That's yeah. what how the priest described it. Um, without there being some type of audio tape or something, you know, or videotape, you know, all you have is the priest's word. Yeah. So I mean, it. I guess with any of this kind of stuff, there's always going to be those people who will claim mental illness. Ooh, or yeah. or sexual abuse, or or just some you know kid wanting to get that acknowledgement. But then there are also aspects of it that, like you say, can't necessarily be explained. Mm-hmm. So, uh, moving on, I found another. This is from an author, another author named Mark Op- Opsasnik. Right, he uh, wrote. I looked that up as well. He wrote. Uh, he he does a bunch of different stuff, but with rock and roll, uh, but also different stuff. He wrote uh, a publication on the Maryland Bigfoot, uh, miscellaneous and unknown, as well as the real story behind the Exorcist in two thousand six. So uh, he questioned many of the supernatural claims associated with the story, uh, proposing that Roland Doe was simply a spoiled, disturbed bully who threw deliberate tantrums to get attention or to get out of school and just kept it up after getting beaten. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, Obsess- Ob- Obsessnik uh, reports that Halloran, who was present at the exorcism, never heard the boy's voice change. He thought the boy merely mimicked Latin words he heard clergymen say. I mean, this was before uh, Vatican II. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> um, rather than gaining a sudden ability to speak Latin, uh, Obsessnik reported that when marks were found on the boy's body, Halloran failed to check the boy's fingernails to see if he had made the marks himself. 
Um, Absasnik also questioned the story of Hughes' attempts to exercise the boy in his subsequent injury, saying he could find no evidence that such an episode had actually occurred. Uh, During his investigation, Absasnik discovered a couple things here. The exorcism did not take place at 3210 Bunker Hill Road in Mount Rainier, Maryland. The boy never lived in Mount Rainier. The boy's name, the boy's home was in Cod City, Maryland. Much of the commonly accepted information about the story is based on hearsay. It is not documented and never fact-checked. There is no evidence of Father E. Albert Hughes visited the boy's home, had him admitted to Georgetown's hospital, requested that the boy be restrained. Um, And there is ample evidence refuting claims that Father Hughes suffered an emotional breakdown and disappeared from the cottage study community. Gee, I wonder why. So... I, some of this stuff was really interesting because I don't, in all my research around Roland Dahl, like I never came across anything around Mount Rainier or whatever that would be needed to be proven inaccurate. So yeah, I don't know, never. like I don't know if that was maybe that was part of the story at the time uh, that that worked its way in there or somebody misunderstood a, a fact or whatever and, and, and included that. As yeah, part we of the story. we're not seeing his his publication or the documentary he was a part of or anything like that to see the full story. There. Well, also he, he said there's no documentation of this happening, and his book came out in what 2006. Yeah, yeah. yeah the documentation but, from the priest wasn't found until like about 2014. So then <clears throat> it'd be interesting to. Uh, Maybe I'll uh, try to do this. I might reach out to this obstinate guy and say, and say, hey, uh, <laughs> you wrote this book uh, since this. Uh, have you had a chance to watch The Haunted Boy? And uh, what's, your, <laughs> what's your thoughts on since this new evidence has been uncovered? Yeah. Shots and, and, and fired. He, he was talking about uh, <laughs> uh, Raymond Bishop uh, or Bishop Raymond. Uh, you know, we got to meet the guy. We got to interview him. He seemed credible. You know, and the first thing you're going to think of is, you know, why would a priest lie? Right. right. And he talked about a lot of it, but he also said the boy was extremely troubled. They all said that. Yep. Uh, but, again, there was things that they just could not, you know. Right. Document at the time as to, wow, I see monkeys flying. You know, that right. type of thing. Right. And... You know, they said, other than him having a documented past, which he did, and that's where the whole uh, the hospitals and stuff come in. Right. All right. They said time down as soon as he came in the hospital, and that was in Maryland. All right. And they're thinking it's something mental. Right. All right. And again, spoiled brat. Yep. Do something. Trying to get attention, yep. whatever the case would be. Yep. And you know, it escalated past that to where now. They've got him tied down to a bed in a Jesuit uh, hospital, you know, in a total different state, and yet they are doing, you know, holy readings on him every day, right. everything else. So something made them continue continue to yep. do it, you know, something somewhere, and that's where this diary comes in, right? And you know, there's been said there's probably more to it than this. Oh, well, I'm sure there but is. There, but we'll never know because <laughs> right. it is locked up in yeah, the Vatican. Under lock and key. Yeah, and so, again, you know, now you get to the conspiracy, conspiracy theory, theory right. and everything else. We don't know. You know, that's just like, uh, you know, the Ark of the Covenant might be there in the Vatican. <laughs> Who right. knows? Yeah, know? in the Vatican uh, or in the Army base. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Sitting there with... Fiery letters burning on the <laughs> yeah, side. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it says open sesame. Along yeah. with the crystal skull. Yeah. So um, we got a couple other uh, potential answers for why it didn't happen. <clears throat> Take Again, I'm not trying to talk you out of it. I'm just offering. No, uh, you know, here's, here's the thing. When you're dealing with anything, UFOs, uh until we get some definitive proof, Bigfoot, you know, yeah. until somebody blows one's head off and drags <laughs> its carcass out of right, the Right, and the government doesn't grab it first. Right. right. You know, this is a faith-based hobby. Yes. That's all it is yep. right now. Because you've got to have faith mm-hmm. that what you're reading and what you're trying to find out researching is the truth. 
and you know that this stuff happens. Yep. So you know, at the end of the day, you can choose either to believe or not to believe. Correct. Yep. <clears throat> so um, just a couple of things that I'll note here. Um, so two psychiatrists, Rob Doe. Uh, sorry, not two T W O. It's two psychiatrists. <laughs> uh, Rob Doe suffered from mental illness. Uh, to priests, this was a case of demonic possession. To writers and film video producers, this was a great story to exploit for profit. Uh, those involved saw what they were trained to see. Each purported to look at the facts, but just the opposite was true. In actuality, they manipulated the facts and emphasized information that fit their own agendas. For sure. I mean, if you look at the asylums of the past, I mean, some of the stuff that we don't even consider vaguely mental illness now was considered i mean even a woman that had very strong menstruation cramps would be sometimes put into an asylum yeah. for being crazy there right? is a two-page document that we've had our hands on and this it varied from state to state but if you looked at your husband the wrong way he could have you locked up yeah yeah yep. you know it well, was the, i mean that i mean that right not true but well but know, no there's that's the, that's the gist of it, you right? Know. There's all there, well. There actually is some pretty uh, crazy laws that used to exist on oh, a, on a oh, state. Oh yeah, by the state rule basis. of thumb too. I mean, just yeah. You know, when we uh, investigated uh, the Roth House, uh, you know, and we were going through all these different uh, places and hospitals, and we were like, "My God, you could get put in here for stepping the wrong way on a sidewalk." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's crazy, and that and that's kind of my point here. And then I think we still do that. I think that doctors and psychiatrists may still see some of those things that we just haven't figured out answers for yet. And, and this, that's what this totally could be, that this kid fooled him. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's the biggest fear that some of us that do purport to have some psychic abilities and stuff, my sister, myself included, and things like that, my sister was always so afraid she was going to be found crazy, or yeah. was she crazy? Was this a sign of insanity, you know? So, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's all, all of that is there, there is such a, um, a taboo paste, placed on all this kind of stuff from the social aspect that mm -hmm. really makes a lot of people afraid to come out <clears throat> and talk or say anything that may cast them in a light that they might be considered uh, crazy or whatever the case may be. So, yeah. So I'll offer, I'll offer one more thing, and this is from a skeptic, uh, Joe Nickel. So um, Joe Nickel says that uh, uh, things like the, the writing on his body could have been uh, done with a wall. He could have stood in front of a wall mirror and used his finger yeah. or whatever to scratch things on his body. Um, and he says nothing that was reliably reported in the case was beyond the abilities of a teenager to produce. The tantrums, trances, moved furniture, hurled objects, automatic writing, superficial scratches, and other phenomena were just the kinds of things someone of Ronald's age could accomplish, <clears throat> just as others have done before and since. Indeed, the elements of poltergeist phenomena, spirit communication, and demonic possession, taken both separately and especially together, as one progressed to the other, suggests nothing so much as role playing involved trickery. Oh, I agree. I mean, look at the Fox sisters. That started a yeah. whole spiritual movement in this country. And come to find out years later, yeah, they admitted, oh, we were playing game. Yeah. Well, just, I mean, look at Millie Vanilli. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. You're dumb. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to light the mood a little that was, bit. That was a good one. That was good. That was <laughs> caught me off guard, but that was good. <laughs> so yeah, so um, bottom line, uh, whether you believe that it occurred or you don't, um, I think at the end of the day, the takeaway is is that uh, this thirteen-year-old boy uh, had something going on. Whether right. it was demonic possession or some mental illness. He was in pain. Yeah. And um, and if he was such a ratty, bullying kid, the fact that r after that he was the sweetest boy that could ever could be. Yeah, I mean, how do you just all of a sudden, after all of that, just click and 
all of a sudden you're now going to, oh, I think I'll go off and become a rocket scientist right. for NASA. So mm-hmm. it's just, you know. I, I, mean, yeah, I mean, and they made no money off of this. Right. And that's my yeah. other point about all the priests. The priests aren't in things for the money. I mean, they... Well, I'm the, talking about the family or the yeah, priests. But None it, of them. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, this isn't like, you know, during uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, <laughs> you know, with that evil priest, you know. Right. And well, I mean, I mean, then, you know, the monks actually paid for them to come from Maryland to St. Louis. You know, the, the travel and everything else. Right. And... Yeah. You know, the only money that got made, which was almost 30 years later, or, you know, 22 years later, was by William Peter Blatty when he put out the book, yeah. The Exorcist. And and that's something that I've always said about all these, like, family hauntings or different things like that, especially some of these earlier ones. I'm like, who would put their family through that on a hope and a prayer that they might right. make money off of it? Yeah. Like, you know, like, now, granted, nowadays where we've had so many, oh, yeah. sure, I can be more skeptical, but, like... When this was a thing that was few and far between, and especially in a culture that very much looked down. I mean, you look at uh, Betty and Barney Hill, you know, like, Mm -hmm. why they were already an interracial couple, which was already a thing that was horrible to the people back then, you know, and they're coming out saying they were abducted. Why would these people put themselves through that? Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's the same with this. Why would they put this kid through all this? Especially in the time of... You know, of when they lived in. Yeah. You're right. I mean, that was just, that was taboo. Oh, you right. kept, I mean, this is the, like, late 40s or 50s. Like, you kept that mm-hmm. stuff to, to yourself. yourself. Right. I mean, abuse and everything was I kept. Mean, you know, yeah. I, I, I hate to say it, but, I mean, they still did lynchings back then. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just, yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, I, I only imagine that, I would assume that based on the, the news articles and things probably came out after, or, or at least in the middle of, of kind of how things were going, so that I, they didn't I don't have to remember. Yeah, they didn't have to hopefully worry about a lot of uh, retaliation or anything from the community that this was all taking place in. But I could imagine even some community outrage with, mm-hmm. "Can't believe you brought this into my neighborhood or into my well." So see, that's the thing; nobody really knew about it that it was actually happening in St. Louis because of the book and the movie. The movie pushed it as happening in Maryland. Maryland. Yeah, yeah. Or, or at least in D.C. Yeah. I mean, it's that area. Right. So. That had nothing to do with St. Louis. Right. And then it was just kind of like the neighborhood gossip and stuff like that. Right. And then radio stations would go there, you know, every Halloween and broadcast from there and stuff like that. Right. But nobody actually went and did an investigation until we got there and filmed it. Yep. So, and so how did you guys, we've got a few minutes, I'm curious to ask about this, how did you guys catch wind of that? Uh, Greg Myers, who is from St. Louis, actually contacted, and Greg, we've had him in several movies with us, mm-hmm. he contacted the Booth Brothers and said, hey, now you know the exorcist actually happened here. Hmm. And that that's all it took for, you know, these two filmmakers to oh, go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, even if even if it turned out to be nothing, I'd still want to know more about it. You know, well, I mean? Greg put in so much work on this, him and uh, lady and Sandy, that they handed over a ream of research about three inches thick of, you know, what all happened here, you know, and the times and dates and everything yeah. else. I mean, that's just... Uh, so I, I do want to ask, and, I, and you, it may be covered in the documentary. I got to be honest; my uh, my daughter was not letting me finish last night. Um, what happened to the to the diary that, that was found? I guess that is the, the original diary is in the Vatican. So they took it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we got copies of it. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, t- uh, old fashioned typewriter. That's yeah, how they yeah. did it. You know. So that's crazy, man. Uh, and uh, briefly want to touch again on that the curse aspect, the exorcist curse, well, you know. And then even you said your crew had we crazy. had things happen, but I don't know if I want to call it say we were cursed or right. Not. Oh yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know how I feel as a pagan. I don't uh, even know how I feel about yeah. curses. But you know, <laughs> even Linda Blair, who you know I've I've worked with and we've got to know each other through the years and stuff. Uh, I mean, she had her back broke while they were filming yeah. this. You know, they, but that's because they just weren't treating her very yeah, good. Yeah, they weren't doing, <laughs> yeah. they were doing something right. Yeah, and uh, and she thinks that things through the years, she, you know, says it's very easy to automatically just blame it on the exorcist. But 
I mean, you know, people get up here and they, they do point out the, the Booth brothers both got very, very ill. I ended up having brain surgery, a stroke, and a bunch of heart attacks. But the three of us are also have been musicians from the time we were 13. Right. And, uh, yeah. I was going to say, you, you, <laughs> lived, you lived a quiet uh, a life before yeah, that, right? Yeah, I mean, so we musicians. were just puritanical. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I mean... Look at me. Do I look puritanical? You know, uh, you know well, you like you, the Quaker Oats guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm surprised. Well, Harry White yet. I, I'm surprised you didn't wear your hat with the belt buckle on it. <laughs> um, well, I want to move into uh, real quick into our listener story before we wrap things up here. Uh, we've got one this week comes from a person, once again, from the Haunted History of Kentucky. Like I said, this has become my favorite Facebook group. People are so willing to share on there yep. like no other group. Um, and this comes from a patron on there called MJ Sweat. Here's his story. I lost my beautiful fiance in February 2017. I recall some of the last things she said, but more vividly I recall what she said to me just 24 hours before she had an aneurysm and slipped into a coma. I worked as a bouncer at a club in downtown Louisville. She stayed here with my grandson we had custody of. She was normally in bed when I came in, but that Saturday she couldn't sleep. When I got home, she told me that she went to the bathroom and washed her face, and when she looked behind her, a tall, dark figure was there. She screamed, and in fact, she called me several times that night. Unfortunately, though, that was the last night we shared together. I don't think my heart has ever healed. I never believed in anything like this stuff before, but she was the most truthful person I had ever known. And even when she knew I'd be pissed about something, she always still told me the truth. But it made me wonder. Is there really an angel of death? And is that what visited her? All right, yeah, so possibly the angel of death. I mean, yeah. who knows? Well, I mean, I, and I, I remember seeing this uh, seeing this story come up, and some people that were commenting saying, like, well, if she, if she was having an aneurysm later that, or sorry, you know, that, that evening, her, she could have had something going on in her brain where she was, you know, hallucinating or whatever or, the case you know or is that what causes right. you to see it? or you right. know is, hey, who knows yeah i mean no. it's uh, that's 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 the beautiful thing at the end of the day nobody knows nobody knows not yet dude. Nope. i mean nope. we only use what one a quarter of our brain right yeah right you know the rest of it just has been mapped out yet yeah right. so uh send your stories to fearscape podcast at gmail.com or find us on any of our social media at fearscape pod send those there uh and uh, on top of that, I wanted to say, make sure to check out, if you can find it, The Haunted Boy, The Secret Diary of the Exorcist. Uh, uh, That's such a great... Or it's also called The uh, Haunted Boy, The Exorcist, Exorcist Files. Files. Right. Yeah. I saw that as well. Um, so check that out. Of course, check out Keith Age as much as possible because he's the bomb diggity. Uh, you can check out the Louisville Ghost Hunter Society. Um, but we got to get out of here. Time flies, my friend. Yep. And, and just remember, if you like what you hear... Go ahead and click that follow button wherever you get your pods at. Yeah, and like, uh, you know, review and rate wherever you can if you're yep. listening on Stitcher, uh, wherever. Uh, we love you guys so much. Thank yep. you for tuning in. Um, most of you guys know WCHQ is closing its doors on December 31st. Uh, so this is uh, only after this one, two more to two go more. on the radio. So make sure you subscribe to us on uh, where our podcast is so you can continue to listen. Yep. But we got to get out of here. Yep. Uh, but thank you so much, Keith, for stopping by. Always a pleasure. We will absolutely have you back a million times. Thank you. Love to be uh, here. We love it, man. And uh, on that, we'll get out of here. Uh, make sure to listen to WCHQ on 100.9 FM or www.wchqfm.com or check out all the podcasts at the DNN at destinationcomics.com slash DNN. And this is Stefan, and I'm out of here. I'll catch you on the flip side. This has been Josh. The truth is out there. All right, remember, folks, hold those blankets extra tight, and good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.